So you throw all these people into the pot and you've got a lot of opposites. You've got the title, you've got male versus female. There's no in between. Gambler versus the law. There's no in between. Saints versus sinner with no in between. And so Guys and Dolls is really, like I say, it's a little subversive because it draws on the power of love to find a balance between all of these opposites. That was Bill English, one of the co-founders of San Francisco Playhouse. I'm Jeff, and this is Storied San Francisco, a podcast all about the artists, activists, and small businesses that make this city so special. Since I recorded with Bill and his wife Susie back in November, SF Playhouse's run of Guys and Dolls has started. My wife Erin and I were lucky enough to see this famed musical, and oh boy was it special. Every detail, from the sets to the lights to the music, and especially the acting, was really superb. Do yourself a favor and visit sfplayhouse.org for tickets and more information. Here's Bill, followed by Susie. So, I mean, starting, I feel like anything is scary, right? Definitely. Can be, can be intimidating. You had a good reaction. You said, like, you know, asking people, would you come back? And they said, yes. Um, that must have helped. But, like, what else, what, like, you know, a belief in what you brought to the, each brought to the table? Like, what, you know, what was it that was like, yeah. let's keep doing this? Yeah, I think it was mostly just the joy of the work itself. Mm -hmm. It was just so much fun mm -hmm. putting up plays mm -hmm. and being able to control. We'd been in a theater company where we didn't have control and we just basically were constantly um, struggling mm -hmm. to, to, to do the things we want and felt needed to be done. Mm -hmm. And so having control of the directing and the management and the promotion and all those things was just such a lift you know and yeah. we just did one and then we did another one and then we did another one and then we did another one the first season we just did them one by one mm -hmm. there was no plan plan just wanted to just let's just do this right and because figure it out as we the go the place that we ended up was a place that was intended to be retrofitted oh yeah so they wouldn't give us a lease right so we literally were renting the place one month at a time, which mm -hmm. is why it was cheap. They couldn't get anybody into a lease. Mm -hmm. So we started out doing a play that we had, that I had previously directed with Louis Parnell and Kim Richards had done. And we thought, oh my God, we took out this lease in like early November and thought, oh my God, we need to put up something so we can make money, you know? <laughs> and so we did, we put up a play that we had already done. So it went up quickly. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, called It Had to Be You. It was by Joe Bologna and Renee Taylor. It was kind of a, a fairly silly holi holiday love mm. story going up in early December. So, okay, good timing. Yeah, we lucked into that, and people came. And Susie and I would literally go down to Union Square, and this institution is long gone now. Mm -hmm. But there used to be like a, a half-price ticket booth at Union Square. Kind of like the Times Square TKT. Exactly. Thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, Leicester Square in London. They had this. Yeah. This was that version. Yes. And we would go down there with flyers, mm -hmm. and hand out these little flyers to the play that was happening that day. Flyers that you printed at Kinko's. <laughs> am I, am well, I, am I no, dating actually, myself here? No, we actually, there, at the time, there were still, you could get a lot of postcards made oh. for pretty cheap. Lovely. In printing, yeah. So we would actually pass them out, and we would we would literally drum up an audience right. on our own with flyers in hand I at Union it. Square. We'd have a, you'd want to get there right at 10 when they opened, because you'd have a line of 60 people. Oh, wow. And so you had a captive audience. Mm -hmm. And we were both good at it. Yes. And so we discovered that we had some sales ability. That's also known <laughs> as hustle. <laughs> right? You were out there. Because it's also, it's your thing. And you're like, we believe in this. And maybe we don't have a lot of money. And that we don't, we know what we're doing. But we also don't know what we're doing. So we just got to do it. Definitely. Right? That's, I would say that just do it was definitely what 
got us going because first of all the space our first space had a hole in the ceiling so it was freezing cold and uninhabitable really but what bill didn't tell you is that he made his living during his musician and theater days doing carpentry oh carpentry which he learned by doing set design, set building in school and then that parlayed into oh i need to make money so we went and got some carpentry gigs and very with, useful in a theater very environment. useful <laughs> so he had convinced the landlord that we don't care if there's a hole in the ceiling we'll deal with it and i um so he came with being able to build and do theater. I came with my business background mm. and was able to set up the books and, you know, all of that stuff that goes along with it. And um, and were you acting in those early plays? Or what was your role mm-hmm. in, besides books, besides business? Yeah, side? yeah, yeah. No, the whole deal was if I'm not, if I don't get to act, I'm not doing this. Because... The whole point was to create a platform for us to direct and act. Right, right, you know? right. right. So I was still working full time at my, what I call my day CPA job. CPA job. Uh-huh. Um, my CPA, which parlayed into, I was a, became an independent contractor, uh, like a rent a CFO. Oh yeah. Which then parlayed into being a human resources um, professional and basically work, working in corporate America by day and coming to the theater at night. And eventually you stopped doing carpentry and just started doing plays. Yeah, about four years later, I think. But we had we had moved into that space, even though there were holes and all that. That that was what I had wanted to say. I forgot. But, um, I had had many business ideas with friends of, oh, let's do this, and then we'll do that. You know, it's mm-hmm. that whole entrepreneurial feeling that you get mm-hmm. when, especially in Silicon Valley. And so when we decided that we got we're going to do the theater, I said, let's do the theater. I don't want to have folding chairs. I want to have real theater seats. Mm-hmm. So that's what we did. We got found some cheap seats, put installed them. We painted. We invested in the place and uh, put up little Christmas lights everywhere to, Love you know, it. the smoke and mirrors effect of don't notice the holes. We handed out blankets, which ironically, <laughs> we hand out blankets here now, too. Oh, good. <laughs> because San Francisco buildings it's... don't come built in with good heating systems. Correct. But um, anyway, so we just decided we we're going to go for it. Okay. Before we leave that original spot, um, any other notable uh, productions or anything that you want to tell us about? That the I was going to say, the first season, even though it wasn't thought of as a season, it it went from this little potboiler play to a play that we did called The Glory of Living, okay. which was by a, a playwright named Rebecca Gilman, who was very hot at the time. And it was a very, very dark and difficult play. Mm, okay. And I had always liked those kinds of plays. I like audi- plays that challenge the audience and make it a little tough for them, a little uncomfortable, but I also like musicals. So my daughter, Lauren, who was, you know, involved in the beginning of the theater as well, um, she she had wanted to do this play. And I went, I went, ouch, this is a tough play. But we really didn't have anything to lose. And it turned out quite by accident that because nobody else in the, all of her plays were getting done all over the Bay Area, but nobody had had quite had the guts to take on this play. This mm-hmm. But we had nothing to lose. Mm-hmm. So we did it, and that, it required all the critics to come. Mm. They would not ordinarily have come to this two-bit little beginning company, but they had to come see this play. Mm -hmm. And all the artistic directors and the intelligentsia around the area went, why are they doing, who, who, why are (laughs) they they doing this? What do they think they're doing? Right. They'll certainly ruin it, you Mm -hmm. know, and so everybody had to come. So it it was completely uh, luck you know, in a way, but it put us on the map. Just yeah, bang, we were on the map. The Crit Chronicle was saying, this is an introduction not just to a good play, but a very intriguing young company, you oh, know. Yes. And then Susie had a play she wanted to do. It was called The Smell of the Kill. Mm-hmm. And it was another kind of dark Sounds comedy, dark, but it yeah. was a comedy. Dark, yeah. but a comedy oh, great. About, about three suburban housewives in their million-dollar kitchen whose uh, slimeball husbands have inadvertently locked themselves into a meat locker in the oh. basement. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> so the play, and everyone laughs every yeah. time you say that, 
especially women. Mm-hmm. So the the women's dilemma was to decide whether to let the men out or not, mm-hmm. or let them freeze to death. Mm-hmm. Well, it was also the Chronicle came reluctantly because they hadn't liked it in New York, mm. and they came anyway and decided that they liked this one better oh. than the one that had been in New York. Two feathers in, in y'all's cap. Then we were thinking, oh, what shall we do now? Well, I had always wanted to play El Gallo in the Fantastics. Okay. And so, why not, it's right? Your so we hired company. another director, and we assembled what turned out to be a, just a a, um, a list of Bay Area luminaries to oh. be in it. And we opened it up sometime in probably in June and didn't know, have any, didn't have, there was no beginning and end date because there was no season, there was no next play coming. Mm-hmm. So we ended up running it all summer. Oh, wow. Well, what had completely inadvertently happened in those four choices was that we set up a paradigm, you know an MO mm-hmm. for our theater mm-hmm. that we never really have deviated from since. Oh, that's impressive. You know, we'll do a comedy, which is a popular comedy, right? We'll do a very, very edgy piece, challenging piece, uh, a dark comedy, but nonetheless a comedy and a musical. That And that, that will be a season. That was our first season. That, there you go. And so now we've moved, then the second year we did five, Mm-hmm. And the third year we did six. Okay. And so that we never really deviated from that pattern. And now you do six week runs, rough usually, typically. For the musicals, we always do longer. Okay. We, Got it. Yeah, we run them in the holidays and in the summertime. Got so it. So they're usually like ten or eleven weeks. Okay. Um, okay. Well, let's let's get us out of that first place with the hole in the ceiling. Mm-hmm. What came next? We were there for three years, and at the end of the third year, it was time, because of the 89 earthquake, they had to mm. retrofit, because mm. it was an unreinforced masonry building. The threat that had been looming. Yes. They finally, and the reason for the affordable rent. Yes. The very, okay. very affordable rent. Okay. So we were very bummed out, but they said we'd move out, and then they'd fix it, and we could come back. Mm-hmm. And I believe you, Bill was sitting at Lori's Diner up on uh, Sutter at Stockton, or Sutter at Powell, I mean. And um, the artistic director of the theater we were originally company members of saw Bill and said, wow, you look bummed out. What's going on? And he told him. And he said, well, how ironic. I just just signed a lease to move out of my space on Sutter across the street from you to move up to Bush. You want to take over my space? Mm. So we did. So we moved in there thinking we were just going to be there for a year and then move back to the the original. Yes. And we're on Sutter. Just literally across the street. It's, it's still called actors theater, I think. Um, and, um, this is two thousands. This would have been 2006, yeah. Okay, got it. Yeah, so then um, when they finished the retrofit, we said, great, we're ready to come back. And they wanted... They wanted five times as much rent per right. month. Plus, they wanted a down payment of a million dollars, which we were like, what are you talking about? I'm laughing, I'm so, and I'm sorry. I don't mean to make light of this. It's like, I just saw it coming from a million miles away. Yeah, it's They're terrible. like, look what we did for you, and give us all your money. Yeah, we didn't you don't have, have the money. That you don't have. And we said, well, yeah. your space sat empty ten years before we were in it, and with your their retrofit at least they kept they kept the theater space they didn't put a post up in the middle of it thank mm-hmm. god mm-hmm. but they put a post up in front of the door to the men's restroom and post every so the whole place would need to be remodeled mm-hmm. and they expected us to fund that did they fix the hole in the ceiling <laughs> I don't know because quite honestly Or is that good for earthquakes? I don't know. We've been out of that space since two thousand and six and now it's twenty twenty four and it's yeah. sat empty since right? we left. Yep. It's still empty, ironically. These are all it's like these are stories as old as San Francisco. It's terrible. Uh, it's not new and it's 
it is what it is. I, you know, I have my judgments, but it yeah. is so sad. I, terrible, I mean, yeah. the dream would be to, we would love to have that as a second space because mm-hmm. you could have a 150 or a hundred seat theater up above and then some little studio spaces for the nomadic companies that are around now and classes mm-hmm. and all kinds of things, but it's sitting there empty. Mm-hmm. So that part's sad. So we spent, so we stayed where we were At, across the street mm-hmm. up on Sutter mm-hmm. for six years. And then um, I would say, you know, we, we built a good solid subscription base and we started wishing that we were in some place bigger cause it was a 99 seat theater. Mm-hmm. And, um, what kind of capacity were you thinking or, or dreaming about? I had always imagined 200, 250 seats because, um, by then I was, I was going to New York a lot. My, my daughter was in school there and I'd go to visit her and I'd go to all the theaters and I got very familiar with the New York nonprofits mm. theaters of right. which there are six or seven great ones you know okay and they're all about that size mm. so it seemed like you can't really make it on a hundred seats but you can make it on 250 okay because there was you know the vineyard and the New York theater workshop and the Atlantic and Manhattan theater club the signature theater are these second stage what is what is, what is known as off broadway yes yeah, yeah. they're considered okay. off broadway but they're they're not only off broadway but they're non profits okay you know a lot of the off broadway theaters are just you rent it and you put up a show like sure. broadway sure right? sure but these were theaters that were like what we were. They're not for profit. They have donor base and subscribers. And so you all were a nonprofit from day one. Yes. Okay, that's important. Skip Do you that want to talk about that? That was yeah, one let's... of the things that Susie did. In addition to getting real seats, she went straight out and got our nonprofit. Not I for love profit. it. Okay. I mean, is there much to talk about there? It's like. I just thought it was how, what we needed to the do. The way to do it. We. I mean, we did skip a piece of our history in that we thought we were going to be filmmakers. Oh. (laughs) You did mention the dream of being at the Academy Awards. An Academy Award, right? So that was the path I wanted to be on. And we made a small film in our home that had several locations. But because Bill was a carpenter, he would just change... He built walls inside of our walls that we repainted and put different curtains so that it could be the next door neighbor's house. And then we would do exteriors elsewhere in, we live in Point Richmond. And um, what we learned from doing that is that it costs money that you don't necessarily get back, even though we loved doing it. So while we were looking for another script, we were reading a lot of books, trying to figure out how to get the rights to them to make a movie out of it for our next film that was when about the same time this theater became available and when we produced our first play what we learned is you can usually break even Mm. so you're not putting in money that you're not getting back right and if you become a nonprofit, you can get people to help you right so you're really not lose the film i didn't i don't i don't know that there's an equivalent to a nonprofit filmmaking maybe there is yeah. But um, so we we soon put our attention on theater because we were still able to be um, artistic, but we didn't. There was as long as we could break even, we could keep doing it. Right. So Quicks. it became two roads diverged in the yellow woods, you know. And yeah. We. Quick sidebar: Did the film ever get finished? Oh yeah, we submitted it. Is there a digital version? <laughs> yes, there is. I want there to see is. it. I you, totally. There is. Maybe my, maybe my listeners want to see it. Oh, cool. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, though. Here's the thing. He's got it right That's here. That's so it's fun. VHS. Yeah, VHS player? <laughs> oh, no. Sadly. <laughs> I need to make a... I Give need to me. make a... Is uh, that... Well, there was a... digitize that. Can you do it's, it? Yeah, it's yeah. called Possessions. Pos- possessions, yes. For those yes. at home. Yes. So it was a... The, the problem with the movie was that it was a 40-minute movie. Okay. So it was too long to be a short and short, too, short too short to be, to be long. long. So when, but we tried editing it down to be less than 20 minutes and it just wasn't as good. Mm. But we did submit to film festivals. We went to the Sundance Film Festival oh. just to see what, what to, you know, learn about our next step. And I think it's still a dream that sits in there, but it's just, you know, it's now we've got 20 years under our belt as theater. And we'd have to stop doing this. Yeah. I think. Well, no, so that's a, that's a great 
uh, allegorical way to talk about how you became a nonprofit. And thank you for that. Um, but now let's, yeah, let's, let's go forward to the, how many years were you six at the place years. on Sutter? Six years. Six on years Sutter. on Sutter. And okay. then, um, this space opened up at the same time that we were doing My Fair Lady. Right? How did you find out? Well, it's an interesting story. It had been empty and I had gone to the leaseholders for the space and what I wanted to do, it, it originally the, it was an Elk Club Grand Meeting Hall. So right. it was more like a banquet hall with a flat floor and a stage of sorts. You know, mm -hmm. the Elks came, were originally amateur theater people mm -hmm. in New York. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to drink after their Sunday performances. And because they had the Blue Law bars closed on Sunday, they started a club so they could have a drink. <laughs> and they're still at it. Up yeah. there on yeah, the third are. floor. Yes, they are. Right? Yes, for, for those at home, um, <laughs> the current SF Playhouse is in the same building as the San Francisco BPOE. Right. Yeah. And the Elks Elks actually, number three. three. Elks Lodge number, number three. three. The Elks actually own the building. The building. Yeah, yes. they own the building, but Correct. they don't control the spaces because, Within. you know, when the membership of the Elks started to dwindle and all the men's and women's social movements sort of kind of fell apart in the late 20th century in terms of masses of people, they didn't have the wherewithal to really manage the building. So right. they leased the building out to a real estate holding company. Okay. Who in, and that's when it became a theater. That's when the, the hotel. restaurant went in downstairs. Restaurant. The rooms were originally just for visiting for Elks. Elks. Yeah. So that's when it became a hotel, and that's when this became a theater. Okay. But it was a great big barn of a theater with mm. 700 seats. Oh, wow. Even though the Johnny Rhinus, the guy that, that ran it, made a success of it somehow but it would be way too big for us you know we were coming from a hundred seat theater and our patrons would have killed us if we made because the intimacy was an essential part of the experience mm -hmm. so 250 was kind of the intimacy limit I in thought your mind so. yeah, yeah yeah i thought so Absolutely. i still kind of do you get over 300 you lose some of that you yeah. know yeah so I, my idea was and they, uh, johnny rhinus had built a a, the, a seating ramp on top of the flat you know, banquet hall floor. Okay. So my idea was to tear out the ramp and build a theater in there that was a 300-seat theater, but which could be rearranged in terms of a, being a theater in the round or a three-quarter or a proscenium-style theater by moving the seats around. And I found a seat company in Minneapolis that would provide this portable seating system. Okay. And a friend of mine, Nina Ball, did a beautiful model of what this theater could be, so we thought we could raise money for it. And the, the people that controlled the building just said no. Oh. Because they had this vision that their theater would go back to the glory days of 700 seats. Oh. And that was just never going to happen. They so were it, thinking quantity over quality. So they leased right? it out to another company. And the other company uh, didn't make it. Mm -hmm. They lost both of their... Managing and artistic directors in one season aye, both aye. passed away, and it just they oh. never really quite recovered from that. They were one or two years into a five year lease, and I had a friend who was one of our donors who was on their board. Okay, and I had heard that one of their carpenters had had a hard time getting paid, mm. and so I said, My friend. Keep your eye and ears open to what's going on with this company and let me know if they want out. And that's exactly what happened. Okay. We and ended up taking over the lease of another company and moving in here. My math is roughly 2012? Yes. 2013, exactly. 2012. Okay. Yes. It was okay. our 10 year anniversary, so it couldn't have been at a better time. In the summer of 2012, we were. We produced a condensed version of My Fair Lady, which sold out like crazy. He, Bill directed it. It was a fantastic production. Everyone came to see it, so much so that we had to turn people away. And that, coupled with this becoming available, convinced our board that maybe we were ready to move into a bigger space. So we did. Okay. Coupled with a, a, a uh, bequest from one of our board members' uncles that was large mm -hmm. and gave us a degree of confidence to move to a bigger space with a longer-term lease mm -hmm. and take on the challenge of making this theater work here. And here we are, 11 we years are. later. 11 years and a pandemic later. Isn't that crazy? And yes. the other crazy thing is our first space was at 
536 Sutter, and then we went to 533 Sutter, which is literally across the street. The street. Mm-hmm. And now if you were a crow, you could just hop. We're just one... We're super 50, close. 450 pose. We, yeah. <laughs> just keep, you keep migrating yeah. south. Yeah, the joke is that pretty soon we'll be at the Geary. <laughs> the <current. laughs> yes. Okay, well, that's that's a great run through the history, but also, do you want to talk about the pandemic? And I think it'd be more fun to start talking just about this space. Sure. Because I think, sure, I don't sure. know this if, if this is of interest to you or to your listeners, but the great thing about this space is that it's a building that the Elks created. And when we moved in here, we there was a certain energy about it that did not feel great. Mm-hmm. And um, what we learned because an elk bartender ran the bar is he said it's full of ghosts i was just about to ask about ghosts is that what is that what you just described as the not great feeling yes it just had a bad vibe i didn't know why and sometimes when we sense ghosts it's it can there's that word benevolent again but like you know it's not it doesn't feel threatening but this one maybe just didn't feel right it didn't feel right i actually wondered if we should move here i said i'm not sure it feels really okay. not good i don't know if it's a good idea for us bad juju bad, bad energy. juju mm-hmm. and then the bartender told me that because there's shelves behind the bar you know where they keep the glasses he said he saw a glass from from the shelf next to the wall jump over the glass in front of it and crash to the floor okay. and he said that's just one example mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so um because it turned out that when this so anyway i had a friend who alcoholic had, ghosts yeah <laughs> well i had a friend who had a friend <laughs> who's very interested in spirit and okay. um she said that she would come over and take a look at the place if i locked her in for two hours and left her alone and so when i did that she reported back that indeed there were a lot of spirits in here and a lot of them were angry and um and a lot of them were also excited when they heard that we might move in because Hmm. they were creatives and so she said that she did a ritual where she invited the angry ones to go ahead and go somewhere else and the ones that were excited to help take over the space and welcome us because we were going to create art here and that's what they wanted. I love it. Did you like that report? I loved it. And I'll tell you yeah. something that when I came back to the space, it felt completely different. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Wasn't there, wasn't it just that, or I thought it was partly at least that some of the angry ones just wanted to be acknowledged and recognized mm. as, as being here and hmm. that they really weren't angry at us. No, they weren't angry at us. No, they they were just angry, angry they, spirits. They felt unagn- it was the anger. But they felt unacknowledged. The yeah. source of it was, right? Yeah, it okay. never felt directed at us. It was just there. And and spirit, if you believe in ghosts and, and that, um, the easiest thing they have to control is electricity. So, it, um, but she, so just to go fast forward, we can talk more ghost stories if you like. But one of the things that I think was great is that in the theater, we have big, huge lights in the, over the house Mm -hmm. and they all turn on at the same time, at least at the time that they did. No, No, they're just 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 part of the decor. Yeah. They're chandeliers that are like Spanish goth. And, um, when you turn them on, all four go on at the same time. Well, our first show we put up was like a big rock concert kind of show. And at the end of it, everyone was just going crazy. And we were filled to the rafters because we invited absolutely everyone to come to opening night. And the most amazing thing that happened was, you know how to rock concert you pull out. Now you pull out cell phones. Some people pull out lighters. Used to be lighters. Yeah. <laughs> Back in the days of stamps. One at the very <laughs> end, one of the lights went on. Okay. And I just leaned over to Bill and I go, the ghosts are giving us their lighter. And ever since then, it's felt really good. And if you talk to our staff, everybody's had their own ghost story. But that's perfect for theater. That's why we put up a ghost light every night. Love it. This episode is going to come out after your upcoming production. Do you want to talk about that since it'll be relevant at the time this comes out? It'll come up after it's closed or after no, it's no, open? No, no, after it's open. Oh, fantastic. Well, Bill's Guys directing it. dolls, right? Yes. Yeah. So do you want to, because I think this would be yes. good for listeners to hear about. We'll, well get yeah, some butts and seats. Yeah, we're going to do Guys and Dolls. We have a cast of 14. 
which some might think is a little small, but we have um, hot box dancers playing gamblers, playing uh, Cubans, playing um, the general in the Salvation Army. So it's a real tour de force for the ensemble. Um, and awesome. and it's uh, I've always loved Guys and Dolls. I would played I played Benny South Street in college, um, but I I sort of rediscovered it and and sort of gained a much larger respect for it. You know, Guys and Dolls actually comes from some stories that Damon Runyon, who's a newspaper reporter for the Times, wrote in the 30s, and they're fantastic stories, and about sort of the underworld, the underbelly of New York in the Depression. And then uh, it was turned into Guys and Dolls in 1950, and it was just, it was really interesting how that kind of humor, his humor, uh, was met by the sort of borscht belt humor of Joe Swirling and A. Burroughs, and the mixture of those two made it what it is. And what I realized about Guys and Dolls is that it's, it's yes, it's great fun, and it's hilarious, and the music is fantastic, but underneath that, it's kind of a subversive satire of what I would call black and white thinking. Mm. or polarized thinking. Mm -hmm. And I realized that that's a problem which has become exponentially greater since 1950. It's been exacerbated. And in fact, it's become the pandemic, or of our, the real pandemic of our time, a hatred. And, you know, we're all divided up, at, up into camps. and Us and them. You can't even talk to yep. anybody in yep. the other camp. Mm -hmm. And and guys and dolls, if you, when I when I announced the season, it was sort of I I like to put all the the uh, posters up on easels with a black little silk covering, and then say something about it. And I said we're going to do a play that takes us back to the darkest days of the depression in New York, a story about sex workers and gambling addicts and right wing religious extremists. What show do you think I'm talking about? And no one knew, and I, then I pulled off the cover. So I've tried to get voilà. into, I've tried to get into the sort of the darker side of the story because it is talking about people who strip for a living mm -hmm. and people who gamble addictively to fight off pain, mm -hmm. and people who are convinced that they can change people to believe their belief as a way of saving them and from, from hell. You know? right. So you throw all these people into the pot, and you've got a lot of opposites. Yeah. You've got the title, you've got male versus female, mm -hmm. there's no in-between. Mm -hmm. Gambler versus the law, mm -hmm. there's no in-between. Right. Saints versus sinner, with no in-between. And so Guys and Dolls is really, like I say, it's a little subversive because it draws on the power of love to find a balance between all of these opposites. And so I really love that. And it actually ties into how I'd like to wrap, which is this. Um, every season on our podcast, we have a theme. And we try to kind of stick with that theme or at least come up with something meaningful and you know, kind of reinforce it. This season, our theme is we're all in it. <laughs> nice. Right? We are I mean, all in that, it. Right? Yeah. So what does that mean to you all? I mean, you've been doing this 20, 20 some odd years? 20. We're in our 21st, 21st season. 21st year. Well, I mean, we call ourselves the empathy gym. Yeah. Can you the idea that? is that we, people come to the theater to see it another point of view and to experience being inside someone else's skin. Theoretically, someone who you might ordinarily not give the time of day, and so that's that basically is is everything we do. Everything we do comes out of that. And guys and dolls. That's is, your mo. That's our mo. That's our mantra. It's over the door. Oh, as you walk out, you'll we'll see it. Yeah. And it's it's basically it's what we believe in. What we believe that theater is for. We believe that we can transform people and society, like one play at a time by giving them an opportunity to identify with them as a person in a laboratory setting where there's really no danger right. to, to being kind or being having positive thoughts towards people who are different than you. I love it. Susie, do you want to say anything about any of that? Oh, no. Bill is the inventor of the empathy gym and what that means. And it came out of, we used to do curtain speeches every night and it it's something that just always stuck and 
really became truly one of our values that I would say every employee here understands. We have a list of values, but if you say, what are the values? I mean, Juan probably even knows Empathy Gym, and he's one of our newer employees. And I think it's what makes us different because we truly invite people in. We want people to come. I, I want it. One of my goals when we set the theaters, I want my family to feel welcome here and they're not theater going people. I want it to be a place where everyone feels like they're welcome and we get to share stories, which is the most humanist of human things that we can do is share our stories. The best. It's right there in our title. Um, obviously, yeah. it's important to us. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, let's wrap, wrap, wrap with uh, how do folks get tickets, find calendar information, that kind of thing. Easy. Plug away. Plug away. You can uh, go to our website, which is sfplayhouse.org, or you can call us at 415-677-9596. And... Or email us, um, info at sfplayhouse.org. It takes you straight to the box office. And what about social media? Do you have a presence Oh, there? social media. This is where we should get Juan over here to say <laughs> something. So, yeah, you can. Um, it's at SF Playhouse on all platforms, Instagram um, and TikTok. We do have a TikTok. So if you want to see some fun clips about the shows, trailers, behind the scenes, that's where you go to find all SF Playhouse related things. And Juan has made us some amazing TikToks. That was Susie Damalano and Bill English, co-founders of San Francisco Playhouse. That voice who joined them there at the end was Juan Rebufo, SF Playhouse's marketing associate, who really got this whole thing together. So shout out to Juan. We're going to take a short break for the busy holiday week, but we'll be back in January with a brand new episode featuring one of our favorite San Francisco musicians, Meredith Edgar. Be on the lookout for episode 6 on January 2nd. Until then, happy holidays. Music for Storied San Francisco was produced, performed, and curated by Otis McDonald. Aaron Lim of Bitch Talk Podcast is our contributing producer. And the show is produced and hosted by me, Jeff Hunt. Now in our sixth season, we have more than 200 episodes available on our website, storiedsf.com or wherever you listen to podcasts. If you're able to, please rate and review the show and drop us a line at storiedsf at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. Keep rejecting those silly doom loop narratives about our city. Stay wacky, weird, healthy, and creative. And we'll see you next time on Storied San Francisco. We acknowledge and respect the first humans of the unceded land we call San Francisco, the Ramaytu Shaloni. We condemn the genocide of these and other tribes across the Western Hemisphere. We honor their legacy and history, and we support rematriation and sovereignty efforts. This podcast is a proud member of the BFF.FM podcast network. Learn more at podcasts.bff.fm. BFF.fm, best frequencies forever.